sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're so glad that you've joined with us today. My name is Dean Forrest and I'm the lead pastor. Now each service we begin by singing a song together. The Bible says in Psalm 136, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His mercy endures forever. Let's worship our good God together.
God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Let's remember that all week this week. I would like to ask you to help us in doing something. Would you scroll down to the bottom of our web page and would you let us know who you are and where you're watching from? We ask all of our viewers to do that every week and it's such an encouragement to find out where you're watching from. I mean, we have people watching in New York and Maryland and even Texas and Ohio and a lot of people watching us in Florida and in the Carolinas. Would you let us know that you're watching today? Also, I have one more request. Would you go to our YouTube channel at Elation Church and would you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us there? That would be a blessing if you could help us out because that will help us to reach more and more people. Today we are beginning a brand new sermon series, Let's Go to the Promised Land. So before we get into today's message, let's pray together. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for each person who is joining us for this service, no matter what day of the week it is. God, because you transcend time, so I ask you to use today's message to speak to each one of our hearts. Let us hear you. Let us follow you. Let us receive your word with gladness today as we discover more about who you are and what you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now as we begin, I want to let you know something. I believe that God always has a place of blessing and provision for His people. And I didn't just pull that concept out of thin air. I mean, as we look at our Bibles, as we began in Genesis, we find a Garden of Eden. It was a place of blessing and provision for man. And God made all that before He made man and woman and placed them in the garden. It was an amazing place. Then later in Genesis, we get to a man named Abraham. Now God had a special place for him, a place of blessing and a place of provision. And God didn't even tell him where it was. He just told him that if you will have faith in me and if you will trust me, I will take you to a place. I need you to go where I'm going to send you. And Abraham said, yes, I'll, I'll follow you. So he ultimately found his place a blessing and provision in the land of Canaan. Now his family grew to approximately 40 people during that time, his descendants, and then there was a famine in that land of blessing and provision. But God had a place ready for them to go, and God sent his people to Egypt. Now when they went there, there was only about 40 people who went. But it was a place for provision for them and a place for blessing for them. When they first went to Egypt, they were the honored guests of the Pharaoh. And after all, one of God's people was second in command, only answering to the Pharaoh himself. Over time, though, over 400 years pass. Now God's people have, have grown to over 1.4 million and the Pharaoh and Joseph, they had passed away. And now the new Pharaoh has God's people in slavery and in bondage. Well, it was time for them to leave and go to their place of blessing and provision. That place was called the Promised Land. It was the land that God had given Abraham, their forefathers, even before they ever went to Egypt. So God brought them out of Egypt and He was taking them to the Promised Land. Now. Now let's fast forward to today. I believe God has a place of blessing and provision for you and for me. It's a place, but it's not a place that we can see with our eyes. You see, it's a spiritual place. Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God, a spiritual kingdom, into this earth. And for the followers of Christ, that's our place of blessing and provision the abundant life in the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. He said He came to give us life and that we would have it more abundantly. Now, let's continue in the Bible because there's going to be a day where there's a place of blessing and provision for us in the future. And the Bible describes that as the new heaven and the new 
earth. So, as you can tell, I didn't just pull this idea of a place of blessing and provision out of thin air because as we track through the Bible, we see that God always has a place like that for His people. Now, here's, here's what our series is going to be about. It's going to be about going to the promised land. Let's go to the promised land. Now, in this series, we're going to look at God's people from their captivity and bondage in Egypt until they get to the edge of the promised land. That's going to be our series. It's going to be a 13-week series. You may say, now why should we look back at them? Well, I believe that everything in the Bible is there for a reason. And it's symbolic in our lives today. Because before we came to Christ, we were just like God's people enslaved in Egypt. Because before we came to Christ, we were slaves to sin. The best that we could produce on our own was sin. But then when we come to Christ, He sets us free from sin. The captivity, the bondage, the shame, the guilt of sin. And then we begin a process. And that process leads us to abundant life in His kingdom. That's what God wants for us. That's the place He has for us. And I believe as we look at the story of God's people leaving Egypt and going to the promised land, I believe there were some things that they went through that would be parallel with what you and I would go through in order to get to that promised land that God has for us. So, let's take a look at the story and we're going to divide it up into sections and we're going to learn everything we can along the way. We're going to start reading in Exodus chapter 2, starting with verse 23. Exodus 2, 23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, 
that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, that was God hearing the cries of his people who had been in bondage, who were living in bondage and living in oppression, and they cried out to God for help. So God sends them a deliverer. His name is Moses. Now Moses was one of God's people, if you recall the story. He had lived in Egypt as an adopted child of the Pharaoh. He had lived there, Pharaoh's daughter, and he had lived there for 40 years. But then he ran away after he did some bad things, and now he had been living and being a shepherd in the wilderness for 40 years. And now God calls him to go back and lead his people out of bondage, out of captivity, to the promised land. God heard their cries, just like God hears our cries when we, when we cry out to him and when we ask him to deliver us from the place that we're in, from the bondage, from the guilt, from the shame. When I cried out to God, he set me free from that. He saved me. He rescued me. He delivered me. Now, here's what we're going to look at today that could possibly apply to all of us. And if we want to go to that promised land, the abundant life in the kingdom of God right here, right now, not waiting till we get to heaven to experience abundant life, but, it, but walking with God, knowing God in His glorious, joy-filled kingdom, here's what we need to recognize. Just like God called Moses for a place of service for a time, you know what? God has a place of service for each one of us in His kingdom. Now, you may say, what? God wants me to do something? I mean, God wants me to be a missionary or a, or a pastor or something like that? No, I'm not saying that because God's not calling everybody to sell their house and go to Zimbabwe, wherever that is. I mean, some people think that's the only people who are used by God or the people who go into a ministry vocation, but no, that's not the case. You see, God has a place of service for every member of His family. Just like a good functioning family operates, each person has something to do for the betterment of the family, God has a place of service for you in His family and in His kingdom. Now, I don't know if you thought that place was just to attend a service or to do something. No, that's, that's not what it is. God, if we follow Him and if we live for Him, you know what? He's going to let us know on a regular basis the things that He would like for us to do in representing His kingdom in this earth as His ambassador. So that's number one. If you're going to experience the abundant life that Jesus wants you to have, you need to find that place of service and you need to be ready and willing to obey God when He speaks to your heart. Number two, when you feel led to do this task for God, when He asks you to do it, most likely you will feel unqualified to do what He's asking you to do or what He's called you to do. Now, I've got a personal story to share with you right now. Um, I'm, I'm a preacher's kid. My dad's in heaven and now, and uh, I grew up as a, as a preacher's kid. And I thought that God and I had an agreement. Um, I, I would do, I would sing because I sang in a group in college. That's where I met my wife, Gana and we sang together. We would go around the churches and sing. But I, I told God this early on. I said, God, you know, I'll live for you. I'll follow you. I want to be part of your family, but I'm never going to be a preacher. I, I kind of told him that. I'd never do it. As a matter of fact, when I was in college in that singing group, I always tried to avoid even sharing a Bible verse or a testimony before we sang. I had had no problem singing a song along with the group of seven or eight other people, but don't ask me to talk. Well, when I was in college at North Greenville University, I took a speech class because most people have to take a speech class. Um, 
Well, here's the deal. I took that speech class and for the first two weeks, everything was going great. And then it came time for me to stand up in front of the class and deliver my speech. You know what happened? The day before I was supposed to deliver a speech in front of 20 people, the day before I went to the registrar's office and I asked them, what was the last drop day to drop a class so that it would not show on your record that you even took it and it happened to be that day, the day before I was supposed to deliver my speech that the teacher had already graded, it was already approved, it was already a good speech, but I was terrified at the thought of standing up in front of 20 people and delivering a speech. So I dropped the class. So later on in 1992, when God called me to be an evangelist, to leave my occupation, I was working at a recording studio at that time in a Southern Gospel record company. Well, when God spoke to me and said, I want you to go on the road and, and be an evangelist, you know what? I was the least qualified person to do anything like that. Now, I'm not saying that God can't use your talents and your gifts and your abilities that you're already operating in. Chances are that's what He's going to do, but the best of us, when God asks us to do something, most of us feel unqualified to do what He's asking us to do. You know, if we were so confident that we'd be the greatest, if I was so confident I'd be the greatest preacher ever, I think I would have a big pride issue in that. But for me to preach, even today, now, it's 27 years later, I, there's still always a little bit of butterflies and, and jitterness in there because I'm not, I can't depend on my own ability to do even what I'm doing today, sharing this message with you. See... I've always felt unqualified to do what God has called me to do, but that cannot stop you like I've not let it stop me. It can't, you can't let that stop you from doing what God has called you to do, what He calls you to do for Him in His kingdom. Now again, He might not want you to do some of the drastic things that He's asked me to do, but each one of us, there is something. There is something. Maybe you would feel unqualified to do it, but don't let that stop you. Number three, here's what I found out. God will use what you have. That day when he was talking to Moses, Moses began to give him so many excuses. He said, I can't go before the Pharaoh because my speech isn't plain. I mean, I don't know if he had a stuttering problem or if it had been 40 years since he had spoken the Egyptian language and and he, now he was speaking a different language in the wilderness and he wasn't fluent in the language anymore. He kind of forgot. I don't, I don't know what it was. Most people think that he might have had a stuttering problem. He says, God, I can't do that. I, I'm not adequate. I, I don't have the speech. I, God, I can't do what you're asking me to do. Well, here's what God said. He said, well, what do you have in your hand? And Moses had a shepherd's staff in his hand. And God said, throw it down on the ground. When he threw it down on the ground, it became a snake. He said, reach down and pick it up. He reached down and picked up the staff, and it became a staff again. See, God was going to use what Moses had and what he was familiar with to be his voice to go talk to the Pharaoh to have his people released and set free so that he could take them to the Promised Land. So just like God used what Moses already had, he's going to use what you already have. You may think you have not much to offer God. Hey, if God can use a stick, huh, He can use what you have in His kingdom work, in your community, in your family, at your workplace, wherever it is, God has something for you to do in His kingdom. And then number four, you see, God has a place of service for you. You'll most likely feel unqualified to do what He calls you to do, and He's going to use what you have. But if you say yes, and if you say, okay, God, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do, if you begin that process to do what He's asked you to do, He gives you four promises. Four promises. And here's something about God. When He makes a promise, you can count on it. 
When God, see, God's not a man that he should lie is what the Bible says. So anytime we find a promise of God, whether it's in the scripture or whether it's through his still small voice of his Holy Spirit, when God promises us something, we can take it to the bank because God always keeps his promises. Here's, here's the promises that he made to Moses, and I believe it's the promises that he makes to us when we say, yes, Lord, we will do what you ask us to do. Even if we might be uncomfortable, God says, I will send you. I will send you. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but when you think about it, God sending us is, is a level of authority when we're sent. If we just go on our own, then we go in our own authority. But when God sends us, we go with His authority. It's just like when the city sends a policeman to go work at a traffic light that's out, he goes with the authority of the government. Well, as ambassadors of Christ, we go with the authority of the kingdom of God when He's the one who sends us. So that's one of His promises. He says, I will send you. So we can go in His name, and in his authority. Here's another promise he makes. He's not just going to send us. He's going to be with us. You know, we can, we can count on him. The Bible says that God never leaves us or forsakes us. We, we can't see him with our eyes, but we can, we can believe his promise and know that he is there. Sometimes we're able to experience his presence and know that He's there. Sometimes it takes a little more faith to know that He is there whether we can actually sense His presence at that time or not because we can't walk by our feelings. We have to walk by faith. So God will send us and then we can be confident that when He sends us, we, send, we go in His authority, but then we don't go alone because He is with us. God is with us. He's there. And then his next promise is this. He says, I will tell you what to say. I mean, Moses was like, what am I going to say? I mean, and God told him in, in his obedience each time, God told Moses exactly what, it, what he wanted him to say. And you know what? God will do the same thing for you and for me. The Bible tells us this, that as we go in God's name, as we go in obedience, that even when we don't know what to say, the Bible's clear. It says, the Holy Spirit of God will give us the words to say as we follow God in what He's called us to do. So we can trust Him, and that's His promise. All we have to do is open our mouth, and God will give us what we need to say. And then the fourth promise that he makes us is this. Not only will he send us in his authority, not only can we rest assured and know that he is with us, not only can we believe that he is going to let us know exactly what to say, he tells us this. He says, I will empower you. Wow. You know what? The Bible says that, that God has given us his Holy Spirit. And He empowers us. The Greek word on the day of Pentecost is, is the same word that we get our word dynamite from. Dunamis is the Greek word. God will empower us to be His witnesses in our homes, at our jobs, in our cities, in our nation, and around the world. God will empower us to follow Him and be His ambassadors no matter where we go. Just like He empowered Moses, but really even to a greater degree now in the New Covenant, New Testament, we, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. See, Moses had the Holy Spirit come upon him at times, but we have God with us and in us to empower us to do everything He asks us to do. So, if we want to, to go to the promised land, we can't just be spectators in God's kingdom. 
God didn't call us to sit on the sidelines. God called us to be ambassadors, to be represent, to be in the game. That's, he called each one of His children to be in the game, not just to be spectators in the stands. So as we close out today's message, let's pray together. God, we thank You for Your truth. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You that You didn't just put these stories in the Bible just to, just to give us reading material. No, that they're there for us to learn. They're there for us to be encouraged. They're there for us to find faith, to trust You, to, to hear You, to surrender to You and the things that You want us to do. God, we want to live in Your place of blessing and provision. God, that's where we want to live. I pray for each one who's joined us today. God, I, I pray that if if they don't really have a sense of what you would have them to do. God, I pray that they would yield to you and by your Holy Spirit, by the still small voice of your Holy Spirit, that you would begin to guide them and lead them. and Let them know exactly what you would have them to do, whether it's something small or seemingly small or seemingly insignificant, or whether it's something huge. God, help each one of us to be obedient to what you've called us to do. Help us to stand with you, believing in your promises and standing in faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today for worship and thanks for being a part of our Elation Church family. One way that you can join the mission of sharing good news of great joy to all people is by inviting your family and inviting your friends, inviting your co-workers to join with us each week here at Elation Church. You may know people who are unable to go to church on Sunday morning because of their work or because of something that's gone on before in a church experience and they're not going to church at this time. Maybe it's a health reason. Invite them to join us. Invite them to come along and be a part of our Elation Church family. Hey, we look forward to seeing you right back here next week as we share good news of great joy with all people. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church.